Section 5 of Tales of the Fish Patrol by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Section 5 Charlie's Coup. Perhaps our most laughable exploit on the Fish Patrol, and at the same time our most dangerous one, was when we rounded in at a single haul an even score of wrathful fishermen. Charlie called it a coop having heard Neil Partington use the term, but I think he misunderstood the word and thought it meant coop, to catch, to trap. The fishermen, however, coo or coop, must have called it a waterloo, for it was the severest stroke ever dealt them by the fish patrol, while they had invited it by open and impudent defiance of the law. During what is called the open season, the fishermen might catch as many salmon as their luck allowed and their boats could hold but there was one important restriction. From sundown Saturday night to sunup Monday morning they were not permitted to set a net. This was a wise provision on the part of the fish commission, for it was necessary to give the spawning salmon some opportunity to ascend the river and lay their eggs. And this law, with only an occasional violation, had been obediently observed by the Greek fishermen who caught salmon for the canneries and the market one sunday morning charlie received a telephone call from a friend in collinsville who told him that the full force of fishermen was out with its nets charlie and i jumped into our salmon boat and started for the scene of the trouble with a light favoring wind at our back we went through the carcanez straits crossed Season bay passed the ship island light and came upon the whole fleet at work but first let me describe the method by which they worked it has a simple diamond-shaped mesh which measures at least seven and one-half inches between the knots from five to seven and even eight hundred feet in length these nets are only a few feet wide they are not stationary but float with the current the upper edge supported on the surface by floats the lower edge sunk by means of leaden weights this arrangement keeps the net upright in the current and effectually prevents all but the smaller fish from ascending the river the salmon swimming near the surface as is their custom run their heads through these meshes and are prevented from going on through by their larger girth of body and from going back because of their gills which catch in the mesh it requires two fishermen to set such a net one to row the boat while the other standing in the stern carefully pays out the net when it is all out, stretching directly across the stream, the men make their boat fast to one end of the net and drift along with it. As we came upon the fleet of law-breaking fishermen, each boat two or three hundred yards from its neighbors, and boats and nets dotting the river as far as we could see, Charlie said, I've only one regret, lad, and that is that I haven't a thousand arms so as to be able to catch them all. As it is, we'll only be able to catch one boat, for while we are tackling that one, it will be up nets and away with the rest. As we drew closer, we observed none of the usual flurry and excitement which our appearance invariably produced. Instead, each boat lay quietly by its net, while the fishermen favored us with not the slightest attention. It's curious, Charlie muttered. Can it be they don't recognize us? I said that it was impossible, and Charlie agreed yet there was a whole fleet manned by men who knew us only too well and who took no more notice of us than if we were a hay scow or a pleasure yacht this did not continue to be the case however for as we bore down upon the nearest net the men to whom it belonged detached their boat and rowed slowly toward the shore the rest of the boats showed no sign of uneasiness that's funny was charlie's remark but we can confiscate the net at any rate we lowered sail picked up one end of the net and began to heave it into the boat but at the first heave we heard a bullet zip zipping past us on the water followed by the faint report of a rifle the men who had rowed ashore were shooting at us at the next heave a second bullet went zipping past perilously near charlie took a turn around a pin and sat down there were no more shots but as soon as he began to heave in the shooting recommenced that settles it he said flinging the end of the net overboard you fellows want it worse than we do and you can have it we rowed over toward the next net for charlie was intent on finding out whether or not we were face to face with an organized defiance 
as we approached the two fishermen proceeded to cast off from their net and row ashore while the first two rowed back and made fast to the net we had abandoned and at the second net we were greeted by rifle shots till we desisted and went on to the third where the manoeuvre was again repeated then we gave it up completely routed and hoisted sail and started on the long windward beat back to benicia a number of sundays went by on each of which the law was persistently violated yet short of an armed force of soldiers we could do nothing the fishermen had hit upon a new idea and were using it for all it was worth while there seemed to be no way by which we could get the better of them about this time neil partington happened along from the lower bay where he had been for a number of weeks with him was nicholas the greek boy who had helped us in our raid on the oyster pirates and the pair of them took a hand we made our arrangements carefully it was planned that while charlie and i tackled the nets they were to be hidden ashore so as to ambush the fishermen who landed to shoot at us it was a pretty plan even charlie said it was but we reckoned not half so well as the greeks they forced all this by ambushing neil and nicholas and taking them prisoners while as of old bullets whistled about our ears when charlie and i attempted to take possession of the nets when we were again beaten off neil partington and nicholas were released they were rather shamefaced when they put in an appearance and charlie chaffed them unmercifully but neil chaffed back demanding to know why charlie's imagination had not long since overcome the difficulty just you wait the idea'll come all right charlie promised most probably neil agreed but i'm afraid the salmon will be exterminated first and then there will be no need for it when it does come neil partington highly disgusted with his adventure departed for the lower bay taking nicholas with him and charlie and i were left to our own resources this meant that the sunday fishing would be left to itself too until such time as charlie's idea happened along i puzzled my head a good deal to find out some way of checkmating the greeks as also did charlie and we broached a thousand expedients which on discussion proved worthless the fishermen on the other hand were in high feather and their boasts went up and down the river to add to our discomfiture among all classes of them we became aware of a growing insubordination we were beaten and they were losing respect for us with the loss of respect contempt began to arise charlie began to be spoken of as the old woman and i received my rating as the pee-wee kid the situation was fast becoming unbearable and we knew that we should have to deliver a stunning stroke at the greeks in order to regain the old-time respect in which we had stood then one morning the idea came we were down on steamboat wharf where the river steamers made their landings and where we found a group of amused longshoremen and loafers listening to the hard luck tale of a sleepy-eyed young fellow in long sea boots he was a sort of amateur fisherman he said fishing for the local market of berkeley now berkeley was on the lower bay thirty miles away on the previous night he said he had set his net and dozed off to sleep in the bottom of the boat the next he knew it was morning and he opened his eyes to find his boat rubbing softly against the piles of steamboat wharf at venetia also he saw the river steamer apache lying ahead of him and a couple of deckhands disentangling the shreds of his net from the paddle wheel in short after he had gone to sleep his fisherman's riding light had gone out and the apache had run over his net though torn pretty well to pieces the net in some way still remained foul and he had had a thirty-mile tow out of his course charlie nudged me with his elbow i grasped his thought on the instant but objected we can't charter a steamboat don't intend to he rejoined but let's run over to turner's shipyard i've something in my mind there that may be of use to us and over we went to the shipyard where charlie led the way to the mary rebecca lying hauled out on the ways where she was being cleaned and overhauled she was a scow schooner we both knew well carrying a cargo of one hundred and forty tons and a spread of canvas greater than any other schooner on the bay how do you do Oli? charlie greeted a big blue-shirted swede who was greasing the jaws of the main gaff with a piece of pork rind Oli grunted puffed away at his pipe and went on greasing the captain of a bay schooner is supposed to work with his hands just as well as the men 
Ole Ericsson verified Charlie's conjecture that the Mary Rebecca, as soon as launched, would run up the San Joaquin River nearly to Stockton for a load of wheat. Then Charlie made his proposition, and Ole Ericsson shook his head. "'Just a hook, one good-sized hook,' Charlie pleaded. "'No, I tank not,' said Ole Ericsson. "'Der Mary Rebecca used hang up in every mud bank with that hook. "'I don't want to lose der Mary Rebecca. "'She's all I got.' "'No, no,' Charlie hurried to explain. "'We can put the end of the hook through the bottom from the outside "'and fasten it on the inside with a nut. "'After it's done its work, why, all we have to do is to go down into the hold, "'unscrew the nut, and out drops the hook. "'Then we drive a wooden peg into the hole, "'and the Mary Rebecca will be all right again.' Ole Ericsson was obstinate for a long time, but in the end, after we had had dinner with him, he was brought round to consent. "'I do it by Jupiter,' he said, striking one huge fist into the palm of the other hand. "'But just hurry you up with der hook. Der Mary Rebecca slides into der water tonight.' It was Saturday, and Charlie had need to hurry. We headed for the shipyard blacksmith shop, where under Charlie's directions a most generously curved hook of heavy steel was made. Back we hastened to the Mary Rebecca. Aft of the great centerboard case, through what was properly her keel, a hole was bored. The end of the hook was inserted from the outside, and Charlie, on the inside, screwed the nut on tightly. As it stood complete, the hook projected over a foot beneath the bottom of the schooner. Its curve was something like the curve of a sickle, but deeper. In the late afternoon, the Mary Rebecca was launched, and preparations were finished for the start upriver next morning. Charlie and Ole intently studied the evening sky for signs of wind, for without a good breeze our project was doomed to failure. They agreed that there were all the signs of a stiff westerly wind, not the ordinary afternoon sea breeze, but a half gale, which even then was springing up. Next morning found their predictions verified. The sun was shining brightly, but something more than a half gale was shrieking up the Carcanez Straits, and the Mary Rebecca got under way with two reefs in her mainsail and one in her foresail. We found it quite rough in the Straits and in Suisun Bay, but as the water grew more landlocked it became calm, though without let-up in the wind. Off Ship Island Light, the reefs were shaken out, and at Charlie's suggestion, a big fisherman's staysail was made all ready for hoisting, and the main topsail, bunched into a cap at the masthead, was overhauled so that it could be set on an instant's notice. We were tearing along, wing and wing, before the wind, foresail to starboard and mainsail to port, as we came upon the salmon fleet. There they were, boats and nets, as on that first Sunday when they had bested us, strung out evenly over the river as far as we could see. A narrow space on the right-hand side of the channel was left clear for steamboats, but the rest of the river was covered with the wide-stretching nets. The narrow space was our logical course, but Charlie at the wheel steered the Mary Rebecca straight for the nets. This did not cause any alarm among the fishermen, because upriver sailing craft are always provided with shoes on the ends of their keels, which permit them to slip over the nets without fouling them. "'Now she takes it!' Charlie cried, as we dashed across the middle of a line of floats which marked a net. At one end of this line was a small barrel boy, at the other the two fishermen in their boat. Boy and boat at once began to draw together, and the fishermen to cry out as they were jerked after us. A couple of minutes later we hooked a second net, and then a third, and in this fashion we tore straight up through the center of the fleet. The consternation we spread among the fishermen was tremendous. As fast as we hooked a net, the two ends of it, boy and boat, came together as they dragged out astern, and so many boys and boats coming together at such breakneck speed kept the fishermen on the jump to avoid smashing into one another. Also they shouted at us like mad to heave two into the wind, for they took it as some drunken prank on the part of scow sailors, little dreaming that we were the fish patrol. The drag of a single net is very heavy, and Charlie and Ole Erickson decided that even in such a wind, ten nets were all the Mary Rebecca could take along with her. So when we had hooked ten nets with ten boats containing twenty men streaming along behind us, we veered to the left out of the fleet and headed towards Collinsville. We were all jubilant. 
Charlie was handling the wheel as though he were steering the winning yacht home in a race. The two sailors who made up the crew of the Mary Rebecca were grinning and joking. Ole Ericsson was rubbing his huge hands in childlike glee. "'I thank you fish patrol fellers never been so lucky as when you sail with Ole Ericsson,' he was saying when a rifle cracked sharply astern and a bullet gouged along the newly painted cabin, glanced on a nail and sang shrilly onward into space. This was too much for Ole Ericsson. At sight of his beloved paintwork thus defaced, he jumped up and shook his fist at the fisherman, but a second bullet smashed into the cabin not six inches from his head, and he dropped down to the deck under cover of the rail. All the fishermen had rifles, and they now opened a general fusillade, we were all driven to cover, even Charlie, who was compelled to desert the wheel. Had it not been for the heavy drag of the nets, we would inevitably have broached two at the mercy of the enraged fisherman. But the nets, fastened to the bottom of the Mary Rebecca, well aft, held her stern into the wind, and she continued to plough on, though somewhat erratically. Charlie, lying on the deck, could just manage to reach the lower spokes of the wheel, but while he could steer after a fashion, it was very awkward. Ole Ericsson bethought himself of a large piece of sheet steel in the empty hold. It was, in fact, a plate from the side of the New Jersey, a steamer which had recently been wrecked outside the Golden Gate, and in the salving of which the Mary Rebecca had taken part. Crawling carefully along the deck, the two sailors, Ole and myself, got the heavy plate on deck and aft, where we reared it as a shield between the wheel and the fishermen. The bullets whanged and banged against it, till it rang like a bull's-eye, but Charlie grinned in its shelter and coolly went on steering. So we raced along, behind us a howling, screaming bedlam of wrathful Greeks, Collinsville ahead, and bullets spat-spatting all around us. Ole, Charlie said in a faint voice, I don't know what we're going to do. Ole Erickson, lying on his back close to the rail and grinning upward at the sky, turned over on his side and looked at him. "'I tank we go into Collinsville, you der same,' he said. "'But we can't stop,' Charlie groaned. "'I never thought of it, but we can't stop.' A look of consternation slowly overspread Ole Ericsson's broad face. It was only too true. We had a hornet's nest on our hands, and to stop at Collinsville would be to have it about our ears. "'Every man jack of them has a gun,' one of the sailors remarked cheerfully. "'Yes, and a knife, too,' the other sailor added. It was only Ericsson's turn to groan. "'What for a Swedish feller like me, monkey with none of my busyness, I don't know,' he soliloquized. A bullet glanced on the stern and sang off to starboard like a spiteful bee. "'There's nothing to do but plump the merry Rebecca ashore and run for it,' was the verdict of the first cheerful sailor." "'And leave to marry Rebecca?' Ole demanded with unspeakable horror in his voice. "'Not unless you want to,' was the response. "'But I don't want to be within a thousand miles of her when those fellers come aboard,' indicating the bedlam of excited Greeks towing behind. We were right in at Collinsville then, and went foaming by within biscuit toss of the wharf. "'I only hope the wind holds out,' Charlie said, stealing a glance at our prisoners." "'What of der wind?' Ole demanded disconsolately. "'Der river will not hold out, and then, and then?' "'It's head for tall timber, and the Greeks take the hindmost,' adjudged the cheerful sailor, while Ole was stuttering over what would happen when we came to the end of the river. We had now reached a dividing of the ways. To the left was the mouth of the Sacramento River, to the right the mouth of the San Joaquin, the cheerful sailor crept forward and jibed over the foresail as Charlie put the helm to starboard and we swerved to the right into the San Joaquin. The wind, from which we had been running away on an even keel, now caught us on our beam, and the Mary Rebecca was pressed down on her port side as if she were about to capsize. Still we dashed on, and still the fishermen dashed on behind. The value of their nets was greater than the fines they would have to pay for violating the fish laws, so to cast off their nets and escape, which they could easily do, would profit them nothing. Further, they remained by their nets instinctively, as a sailor remains by his ship. And still further, the desire for vengeance was roused, and we could depend upon it that they would follow us to the ends of the earth, if we undertook to tow them that far. The rifle firing had ceased, and we looked astern to see what our prisoners were doing. 
the boats were strung along at unequal distances apart and we saw the four nearest ones bunching together this was done by the boat ahead trailing a small rope astern to the one behind when this was caught they would cast off from their net and heave in on to the line till they were brought up to the boat in front so great was the speed at which we were travelling however that this was very slow work sometimes the men would strain to their utmost and fail to get in an inch of the rope at other times they came ahead more rapidly when the four boats were near enough together for a man to pass from one to another one greek from each of the three got into the nearest boat to us taking his rifle with him this made five in the foremost boat and it was plain that their intention was to board us this they undertook to do by main strength and sweat running hand over hand the float line of a net and though it was slow and they stopped frequently to rest they gradually drew nearer charlie smiled at their efforts and said give her the topsail ole the cap at the main masthead was broken out and sheet and downhaul pulled flat amid a scattering rifle fire from the boats and the mary rebecca lay over and sprang ahead faster than ever but the greeks were undaunted unable at the increased speed to draw themselves nearer by means of their hands they rigged from the blocks of their boat what sailors call a watch tackle one of them held by the legs by his mates would lean far over the bow and make the tackle fast to the float line then they would heave in on the tackle till the blocks were together when the maneuver would be repeated have to give her the stay so charlie said ole ericsson looked at the straining mary rebecca and shook his head it will take your masts out of her he said and we'll be taken out of her if you don't charlie replied ole shot an anxious glance at his masts another at the boat load of armed greeks and consented the five men were in the bow of the boat a bad place when a craft is towing i was watching the behavior of their boat as the great fisherman's staysail far far larger than the topsail and used only in light breezes was broken out as the mary rebecca lurched forward with a tremendous jerk the nose of the boat ducked down into the water and the men tumbled over one another in a wild rush into the stern to save the boat from being dragged sheer under water that settles them charlie remarked though he was anxiously studying the behavior of the mary rebecca which was being driven under far more canvas than she was rightly able to carry next stop is antioch announced the cheerful sailor after the manner of a railway conductor and next comes merryweather come here quick charlie said to me i crawled across the deck and stood upright beside him in the shelter of the sheet steel feel in my inside pocket he commanded and get my notebook that's right tear out a blank page and write what i tell you and this is what i wrote telephone to merryweather to the sheriff the constable or the judge tell them we are coming and to turn out the town arm everyone have them down on the wharf to meet us or we are gone gooses now make it good and fast to that marlin spike and stand by to toss it ashore i did as he directed by then we were close to antioch the wind was shouting through our rigging the mary rebecca was half over on her side and rushing ahead like an ocean greyhound the seafaring folk of antioch had seen us breaking out topsail and staysail a most reckless performance in such weather and had hurried to the wharf ends in the little groups to find out what was the matter straight down the waterfront we boomed charlie edging in till a man could almost leap ashore when he gave the signal i tossed the marlin spike it struck the planking of the wharf a resounding smash bounced along fifteen or twenty feet and was pounced upon by the amazed onlookers it all happened in a flash for the next minute antioch was behind and we were heeling it up the san joaquin toward merryweather six miles away the river straightened out here into its general easterly course and we squared away before the wind wing and wing once more the foresail bellying out to starboard ole ericsson seemed sunk into a state of stolid despair charlie and the two sailors were looking hopeful as they had good reason to be merryweather was a coal-mining town and it being sunday it was reasonable to expect the men to be in town further the coal-miners had never lost any love for the greek fishermen and were pretty certain to render us hearty assistance we strained our eyes for a glimpse of the town and the first sight we caught of it gave us immense relief the wharves were black with men as we came closer we could see them still arriving stringing down the main street guns in their hands and on the run charlie glanced astern at the fisherman with a look of ownership in his eye which till then had been missing 
the greeks were plainly overawed by the display of armed strength and were putting their own rifles away we took in topsail and staysail dropped the main peak and as we got abreast of the principal wharf jibed the mainsail the Mary Rebecca shot around into the wind, the captive fisherman describing a great arc behind her, and forged ahead till she lost way when lines were flung ashore and she was made fast. This was accomplished under a hurricane of cheers from the delighted miners. Ole Erickson heaved a great sigh. "'I never tank I see my wife never again,' he confessed. "'Why, we were never in any danger,' said Charlie. Ole looked at him incredulously. "'Sure, I mean it,' Charlie went on. "'All we had to do any time was to let go our end, as I am going to do now, so that those Greeks can untangle their nets.' He went below with a monkey wrench, unscrewed the nut, and let the hook drop off. When the Greeks had hauled their nets into their boats and made everything shipshape, a posse of citizens took them off our hands and led them away to jail. "'I tank I've been a great big fool,' said Ole Erickson but he changed his mind when the admiring townspeople crowded aboard to shake hands with him and a couple of enterprising newspaper men took photographs of the Mary Rebecca and her captain. End of section 5 Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com